Heritage Bible Church, happy Sunday, great weather outside, good, uh, good time to serve the Lord, amen. I'm just excited to be here with you all today. So if you would, we invite you to stand with us as we begin our service. And uh, let's say a word of prayer as we do so. God, we love you. And uh, Lord, you are holy and set apart. You are high and lifted up. Lord, who are we that you are mindful of us? And yet you uh, invite us to draw near to your presence. Even now, God, you have allowed us to be with you and near you, to have the mind of Christ, to, to know your heart. God, so we pray this morning as we do that, Lord, as we spend time focusing on you and what you did for us by the blood of Jesus, God, would you give us perspective? Would you fill us with your spirit? And Lord, would you bring us together as a community to build your church and do what you've called us to, to love you with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and our neighbor as ourself. We pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Let's sing together, church. Let's give him praise this morning. 
Amen. Amen. We're going to praise your name this morning, God. Through the trial, through the pain, God, we know that you are faithful and good. And so we sing these words to you. We lift our hands, we lift our voices, God, and we declare your goodness over our lives and our situations. We count. Cause I count on one thing. The same God that never fails will not fail me now. You won't fail me now in the waiting. The same God who's never late is working all things out. You're working all things out. Yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley. Yes, I will bless your name. count, cause I count on one thing, the same God that never fails will not fail me now, you won't fail me now in the waiting, the same God who's never late is working all things out, you're working all things out, yes I will lift you high. church we give him praise this morning we praise you god amen you may be you may be seated in the presence of the lord yep. good morning heritage bible church good to see you here we have several announcements oh yeah and by the way us young people, the way we keep up with things is on our phones, you know. And so we've got the announcements right here on the church app, the sermon outline, and you can give uh, through the app uh, as well. So we have all kinds of things set up to make it more convenient and be able to stay on top of information. We have Fallelujah coming up on October 31st. Well, that's a coincidence because that's Halloween. Hmm. So we need donations of candy. So on Sunday mornings, if you could part with some of your chocolate and bring it and put it, there's a box or something back there, I think. Start bringing chocolate and other candies so that we can hand those out on the 31st. That would be great. We need volunteers to sign up to help with some of the games or booths. And there are sheets at the information booth where you can sign up. 
Married Couples Group resumes this Friday night in the Social Hall at 6 p.m. They're going to start a new book study called Your Time-Starved Marriage. So it sounds like that's going to get personal. Wednesday night, ministries will resume on October 6. Youth group for 7th through 12th grade is already meeting in the youth room. The women's uh, ministry will start a new study on October 6 called Trustworthy. It's a study in 1st and 2nd Kings. And um, we're going to show a video in just a moment. But uh, giving options, let me just run over those. We have the, uh, the app you can give on, and also there are boxes in the back because we don't pass the bags around anymore. We ha and we have a gift for first-time visitors. So if you're a first-time visitor, go to the booth in the back and pick yourself up a gift. All right, we have a one-minute video that introduces uh, the Bible study, Trustworthy. Sometimes I really struggle fully trusting God. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm a Jesus girl through and through, but when hard times come and God starts to deviate from the plan that I'm assuming my life should follow, I'm much more likely to want to tame God, not trust Him. Maybe you can relate. We say we trust the Lord, but then end up exhausted trying to keep everything under control. That's exactly why I want us to learn from some of the ancient kings in the books of First and Second Kings in my new study, Trustworthy. These crucial lessons from the kings are full of wisdom and warnings. We absolutely must unpack, process, and apply to our own lives. This is the Bible study your soul longs to do because you were created to trust God, the one true trustworthy one. Amen. Well, I was asked to share something that happened at youth group last week and the week before uh, during our staff meeting. So I want to encourage you guys this morning. God is moving in powerful ways on Wednesday nights. Uh, two weeks ago, I had a new face come to the youth ministry. And um, I go to say hi to her. And a few of our uh, leaders are going to say hi to her as well. She looks like she's older, maybe a senior in high school. And I go to say hi. And she says, uh, JD, I already know you. And I said, I don't know. I'm sorry. <laughs> I mean, I don't really know it. My bad. Can you remind me how I know you? And um, she told me that years back, maybe six years ago, as I was uh, doing after school um, yard aid type work over at College Heights Elementary School, uh, I used to supervise a bunch of kids for their after school program. And uh, this was one of those girls that I used to talk to and hang out with the group setting wise uh, six years ago when she was in, uh, man, I can't, like fourth or fifth, maybe sixth grade. And uh, she comes to youth ministry uh, out of the blue, out of nowhere. Uh, I think one of her friends invited her. But but uh, she showed up, and she says, yeah, you know, so cool to see you in this new kind of setting. I didn't know that you were a believer at the time. And uh, that night presented the gospel, and she gave her life to Jesus. Uh, so that was incredible to see. Come on, let's put our hands together. Uh, man, God is so good. But, it, it, I mean, it was just cool to see how God is using this ministry and, and honestly my life to just bring people into the kingdom of God. And I'm just so blessed and honored to be a part of what he's doing. Um, and last week as well, we had another new face show up to the youth ministry. And um, anytime I see somebody new, I always want to give them an opportunity to respond to the saving grace of Jesus Christ and the gospel uh, that gives us life. And so I did just that, and uh, she also responded and gave her life to Jesus uh, for the first time. And so, uh, yeah, we are just seeing God move in powerful ways, continuing to do so. And, uh, yeah, just super, super encouraging uh, news this morning. Uh, but, hey, I want to invite uh, the kids to uh, be dismissed with Jen this morning for HK. And as they're doing that, uh, we want to encourage you to stand, and if you'd feel comfortable, maybe say hi to a few people. If not, you can just kind of stand and wave around. That's okay too, but uh, feel free to do that now.
as we continue our service, we'd like to invite you to stand again. And uh, I wanted to bring our attention to this verse in scripture. Um, this morning I started a devotional in the book of Leviticus, praise the Lord, excited for a lot of fire from heaven from that. And um, I was just, I was studying the first chapter and they're talking about burnt offerings and how in order for the Israelites to draw close to God in the tabernacle, um, they would have to sacrifice certain animals. They would have to make themselves uh, ceremonially clean. And they were going through this thing called the burnt offering um, where uh, God says that you can bring a young bull or a sheep or a goat or a bird. And uh, what they would do to these animals, these Israelites, these priests that were wanting to draw near to the presence of God, uh, they would lay their hand on the animal and they would confess their sin sin, and this was uh, metaphorical for the sin of the person, uh, leaving the person, going to the animal, and then they would sacrifice that animal uh, for a couple reasons. One of them was uh, to please God. The Bible says multiple places in the scripture where there was like a smoke, an aroma that would go up to God, and God was pleased with that. Uh, but this was to atone for their sin uh, so they could draw near to the presence of God. And I was thinking about this, and it brought me to Hebrews chapter 9, where it talks about how Jesus is the fulfillment of this cer ceremonial law and how uh, maybe you're thinking about it as I've been saying it, but uh, you know, Jesus took on our sin and God killed, the Bible says, uh, sin in his flesh so that way we can draw near to the presence of God and know our maker and creator personally. So this is what the Bible says in Hebrews chapter nine, verse 11. It says, but when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is not of this creation, he entered once and for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer sanctify for the purification of the flesh, how much more? with the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. In a moment, we're gonna sing Waymaker, and I wanna remind us that the ultimate way that God has made for us is into a relationship with him. Uh, I know that we're all going through difficult things in life if we went around the room and asked, uh, but let's remind ourselves this morning that even if God doesn't, uh, work in a way that we're expecting in our own lives. Uh, God is still good because he's made a way for a relationship with, with the Father by the sacrifice of his own blood. So let's pray, God, we are thankful this morning, Lord, that you are a way maker, God, that you are a promise keeper, God, that you never, uh, your word never returns void. God, what you say will come to pass. It is already completed and fulfilled in heaven because you are sovereign. God, as we sing these words, Lord, that, that, that even when we don't feel certain things, even when our emotions aren't necessarily moving in the way that we would hope, God, we can still trust and know that you are working. God, that you are, you are acting on our behalf, that you go before us and behind us and beside us, and you are living in those of us that are confessing Christians. There is no closer that you could be to us. We thank you for it in Jesus' name.
worship you. I worship you. You are here, doing lies around. I worship you. I worship. Let's sing it again. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop. You never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop. You never stop working. You never stop. Even when I don't see it, you're working. You never stop. You never stop 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 working. great the chasm that lay between us how high the mountain i could not climb in desperation i turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night Then through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished; the end is written. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Could imagine so great a mercy? What heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of ages 
step down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. Come on, let's sing of the cross. The cross has spoken. I am forgiven. We are the King of Kings. says who the sun sets free is free indeed come on let's sing then came then came the morning that sealed the promise your buried body began to breathe now out of the silence the give him his praise. He is worthy of it all. We sing hallelujah to you. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you, worship team. Didn't they do a great job? Don't we serve a great God? Amen. I tell you what, there is no God like God. There is no king like our king. Amen. Well, today we'll be continuing our sermon series on the Sermon on the Mount by looking at Jesus' declaration to his disciples that they be salt and light. However, before we begin, I've got to tell you, 
a story about how salt changed my life. Not a lot of people have a story like this, but salt really did change my life. Let me tell you the story. I, it was 2008, and I had just started here as a children's pastor, and my family had some obligations up in Visalia, and they couldn't come immediately. But the night that they did come, and we, we were going to be together again as a family, I decided to cook dinner. Yeah, you know. You know where this is going, don't you? I, I'm not a good cook, um, but I try, you know. I try. And so I decided that I should do fajitas. That sounds like a good time, you know. So I went down to the grocery store. I got some, you know, thinly sliced meat, and I got some, some uh, bell peppers, and I got some onions and some salsa and avocados, and I brought them all home. And, you know, I started, you know, sauteing them in the pan. And, and man, I, I really do love onions and garlic. I love them a lot. So after I'd, I'd seasoned it with nature seasoning, which is my wife's favorite seasoning, I grabbed some onion powder and some garlic powder, and I just went to town, you know. Oh, my goodness. Woo-hoo, went to town. Had a great time, great time. Now, you may wonder, did, did you taste it before you served it to your family? As many of you probably do when you cook. I do not, because I am an idiot. Um, and so my family come, and they sit down, and I serve them dinner, and it took about 10 seconds in the meal to realize that Basically, it was just a salt lick. Um, because instead of grabbing garlic powder and garlic uh, onion powder, I had grabbed garlic salt and onion salt. And Nature Seasoning also has salt. So we had a salt fest in the pan. To this day, 13 years later, if I cook dinner and I mess up on it a little bit, my children will encourage me and tell me, well, at least it's not as bad as the fajitas. So... <laughs> Yep. Long live my fajitas and their, and their saltiness. Um, so our sermon today is about being salt and light. I think that, um, well, we could definitely use too much salt in dinner. We as Christians could never be too much salt and light in our society. So as we continue the sermon series, Pastor asked me to tackle verses 13 through 16 where Jesus switches gears from what was called the Beatitudes to a lesson on salt and light. Um, as we go through this passage, there's six things I'd like to point out that I think are important for us to understand as we seek to be salt and light. And the first one is, to be salt and light is the kingdom of heaven engaging the kingdom of this world. If you remember last week, to, to pastor preaching on the Beatitudes, he, he preached it, you know, on blessed are the poor in spirit, and blessed are the pure in heart, and blessed, all these wonderful, great, beautiful things. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. And then he, it, it ends with, on a, on a kind of a sour note, really, it says, you know, blessed are if you're persecuted. Well, no one wants to be persecuted. That's no fun, you know? And, and quite frankly, when we, when we hear about persecution, we know that that is a threat to our life. We know that's our threat to our safety. And when we're threatened, our body has an automatic response. They call it fight or flight. Our natural response to, to the possibility of threats to our safety and our well-being is either to fight against it we take up arms and just uh, attack it and destroy it because it's going to hurt us. We're going to run away from it and hide. That's the fight or flight response. But Jesus does not tell us to fight or to flee. Jesus tells us to engage society, to be salt and light in society. It's a very different response. It's not fighting. It's not fleeing. It's engaging. It's to be there in the middle of the chaos, in the middle of the ugliness, and continue to be salt and light. What a powerful command from our Savior. Jesus tells us to engage. Because that's what the king, people who are a part of the kingdom of heaven, that's what they're like. 
You know, everything about the Beatitudes was about the culture of the people who are part of the kingdom of heaven. That's our culture. Our culture is to be meek. Our culture is to hunger and thirst after righteousness. Our culture is to be peacemakers. And our culture is to be salt and light. That's who we are. The next thing I think this this passage really strikes a chord with me is that to be salt and light is a present reality. It's not a future possibility. Now, when Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth, you are the light of the world, he is talking to disciples whom he has just basically met. They haven't been around very long. At this point, you know, for the next you know, few years, they're going to do a lot of dumb things, a ton of dumb things. They're going to argue about who's the best, you know, they're going to be unable to cast out demons. They're going to be unable. They want to call down fire from heaven on cities that reject Christ. Jesus is going to turn to them and say, oh, you of little faith. And even though that is all true, at this moment in time, Jesus calls them right now salt and light. That is their present identity. That's who they are. And so, folks, I declare to you, if you are a child of God, if Jesus is your Savior, you are right now salt and light. It's not something for the future. It's not something for when you get your life together. It's not for this, this ideal dreamland, fairy tale, in the future sometime I'll be salt and light. No, it's today. Today, you are salt and light. It's your identity. It's who you are. Now, I know if you're anything like me, there's times in your life where you feel more salty and dark than salt and light. But our identity is more important than our feelings. Our identity is who we are. And when we realize that this is who we are, we want to act out our identity. We'll realize that if, if my identity is to be salt of the earth, is my identity is to be the light of the world, this is how I should be acting. This is who I am. This is, this is, this is what I've become. You know? It's present tense. It's right now. Let me give you, let me give you an, a, a, an example. So, in 1993... No, 1994. No, 1995. I am really messed up. Sorry. In 1995, I'm going to, my wife's going to give me a hard time about this later. You know she is. On February 21st, 1995, um, Laura Elizabeth Newton, my oldest child, was put into my arms. And I went from being just a married guy to being a dad. My identity completely changed in a moment. Now, did I understand some things about being a dad? Sure, I knew some things. Was I going to mess up a lot over the next 26 years? Yeah, I am. But my identity had changed. And it was now time to live out that identity. Because in that moment, my identity had changed. That's who I was. It's now time to live in that, in that, as that identity. And so let me tell you today, I don't know what you're going through. I don't know what hangups you have, but I know what your identity is. I know you are salt. I know you are light. And it's time to live out that identity. So let's take a look at this passage. Let's start with verse 13. It says, you are the salt of the earth. But what good is salt if it's lost its flavor? Can you make it salty again? It's to be thrown out and trampled on underfoot as worthless. So to be salt, we're going to focus on salt right now. To be salt is to make the world a better place. You know, salt hasn't always had such a bad reputation like it does now. Throughout human history, before refrigerators, salt had two primary purposes. One was to preserve, and the other was to enhance flavor. And if we extend the metaphor to ourselves, our purpose as salt of the earth is one, to prevent decay, and two, to make things better. 
And, you know, we have a long history of making things better as Christians. I mean, yeah, we've, we've messed up as a church. Over the last 2,000 years, we've got a, a litany of, of things where we've totally tripped and fell. Yes, that is true. But you know what? Putting that aside, we've also done some great things. You know, it was believers who helped stop the slaughter in the Colosseum. It was believers who were instrumental in changing education. It was believers who were instrumental in changing prison, in prison reform. It was believers who were in the middle of abolition. It was believers who, who work with the poor, who work with the homeless, who work at, at build hospitals, who build orphanages. There are believers at the center of every good thing that's gone on in society. There are believers there. And they're doing it because they want to be salt. Last week, um, Pastor talked about Mennonite Central Committee. And, and, and one of the things that we see, the more you learn about Mennonite Central Committee, the more you learn that that's what they're out there doing. You know, they're out there just making the world a better place. They're being salt. And that's pretty awesome. That's a wonderful thing. And we, too can be salt. It's a part of our DNA. It's a part of who we are. It's a part of our identity. We make things better. Now, you might be sitting here thinking, well, that, that's good. That, that's wonderful. But that, that sounds like superhero stuff. You know, it sounds like somebody else. Well, let me tell you that God has placed you in your home. He has placed you at your work, he has placed you in your friend groups. He has placed you um, in your activities. And that is where he wants you to be salt, where he's placed you. God is sovereign. You know that. God is sovereign over everything. It, it's, not a, it's not a shock to, to see that, that where God has placed you is where God wants you to be and that's where he wants you to be salt. It's your identity. It's who you are. Be salt where you are. Now, when Jesus talks about salt losing his flavor, you know, a chemistry teacher would, would tell you that really sodium chloride is pretty stable. It doesn't really lose its flavor. But, but what would happen, and it did happen, is that a lot of the salt collection actually happened at the Dead Sea. And all the minerals that would, would flow from the Sea of Galilee down the Jordan River go into the Dead Sea. They would, they would dry there, and much of it was salt. But there was also other, other chemicals. There was other minerals that mixed in. So rather than the salt mo- losing its flavor, what happened is that the salt became mingled with other things. And so you couldn't really taste the salt. It had been, it'd been diluted by everything else. And so, in the same way, if we take this metaphor, one of the things that keeps us from being salty is when we let other things mess with our testimony, other things mess with our walk, other things draw us away from being good, from doing good. And when these things happen, we, we lose our saltiness. And then we could possibly become good for nothing. But we believe better for ourselves. We believe that each one of us wants to live out our purpose. Each one of us wants to be salt in our community, in our schools, in our homes, in our church. We want to live out our purpose because we know it is truly the only way to live. You know, it only takes a few moments watching the news or looking on social media to see how tasteless this world really is. How much decay that's already happened. And we have the salt. And God calls us to be salt. To take the salt out of the shaker and sprinkle it throughout the world. And the world may fight us. It may not want our salt. And they say, get out of here that salt. I don't want it. You mean like broccoli to a two-year-old. But it's who we are. It's what we do. 
we spread our salt. Let's go live out our purpose. Moving from salt, let's look at light. To be light is to point people to the kingdom of heaven. Jesus says, you are the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that can't be hidden. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. I love how Jesus extends this metaphor of light to his audience. He emphasizes that they are like a city on a hill that can't be hidden. In the same way as believers, we should not be hidden from the rest of the world. Further, he says that no one lights a lamp and puts it under a basket. Again, we shouldn't hide our faith from the world. Instead, we should be like the lamp on a stand that gives light to everyone. The lesson is simple. Our light was made to shine. We're called to be light to point the way to the kingdom of heaven. You see, salt is about making the world a better place. Light is about giving direction. It's about showing people who the Father is. It's about showing people what the kingdom's all about. It's about being, people being drawn to us because of our salt and, and saying, wow, there's something special about you. And you're like, wow, you think I'm awesome? You should meet my dad, you know. Let me point you to him. Let me just point you to the kingdom. Because, man, I mean, yeah, I, I can accomplish some good things, but, man, I'm nothing without my dad. Let me tell you about my Jesus, my Savior. Light is about shining. It's about pointing. It's about helping people see what they haven't seen before. I heard about a little boy who was taken by his mother to see a famous cathedral. On the windows, there were pictures of various Christians, and as he watched the sunbeams shine through the stained glass window, he said to his mother, who are those people in the windows? And she said, oh, they're saints. And the little boy looked at the windows and said, well, now I know what saints are. They're the people who let the light shine through. Cute story. I don't know if it really happened. There's a lot of sermon illustrations that pastors share. You're like, did that really happen? Probably not. But it's a nice story. They're the ones who let the light shine through. God has created us to let the light shine through. You know, when we think about shining the light, we often think about uh, evangelism. And evangelism scares the snot out of most people. Like, I don't like that idea. Let's, let's not talk about that. Talk about, you can, can we go back to persecution? I, I think I could handle that better than evangelism. You know, that's the way, it's where we are. It's where I am, you know. Engaging someone in the conversation about God and, and philosophy and, and theology, that just uh, causes us to shiver. But you know, just as God put you in a certain place to be salt, he made you a certain way to shine the light. And you can shine a light in your own way. You know, you might be the kind of person who asks your friends if, if you can pray for them. And, and you're the person that they know, you know, I'm going through stuff, and I know my friend, I don't, I, I don't understand her faith, but I know she prays for me. I'm going to go to her. And that's, that's shining the light. You might be the kind of person who just, just listens. And people come to you because they know they can just talk to you, and there's a peace about you. And you could, you could like, ask them that they want to come to church, you know, or, or just listen to them and, and just... Just be there for them. Or you might be the kind of person who really loves deep theological arguments with people, and you just like, like going toe-to-toe. Well, God bless you, you know, and it may not be you, but, you know, you might be that way. God has made us all different ways and wants us to experience and, and live out being light, how he, how he made us. And finally, to be light is bring worship to the Father. There's this quote by John Piper that that captures this idea beautifully. It says, missions is not the ultimate goal of the church. Worship is. You stop right there just for a moment. Just, Just take that in just for a second. Missions is not the ultimate goal of the church. Worship is. Missions exist 
because worship doesn't. Worship is the ultimate, not missions. Because God is ultimate, not man, when the age is over and the countless millions of redeemed fall on their faces before the throne of God, missions will be no more. It's a temporary necessity, but worship abides forever. Let me go back to that passage. Verse 14, you're the light of the world. The city set on a hill cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand and gives light to everyone in the house. And right here, verse 16, in the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that what? Everyone will praise your heavenly Father. The ultimate goal is worship. It always has been. It always will be. So think about it this way. Have you ever been so, so enveloped in worship? I, I have, but maybe, and I'm sure you have too. Where you're just like, you're worshiping God, and in your heart you're like, God, I just want to worship you more. I want to worship. You are so amazing, Lord. You are so wonderful. My words cannot describe everything about you. I just want to praise you more. Here's the thing, folks. When we live as salt, we are worshiping God. When we live as light, we are worshiping God. When we walk in obedience, we are worshiping God. When we submit to the Father, we are worshiping God. Worship is not from 9.30 to 11 on Sunday. Worship is 24-7 for a child of God. As you're living for God, you are worshiping God. That's your identity. That's what you are. That's what you do. So your worship goes well beyond 9.30 to 11. It's all day, every day. And even more so, as you let your light shine and you draw other people to the Father, what are they going to do? They're going to worship too. So in the same way, you're going to increase your worship by bringing others in. Because it's all about worship. I mean, I'm not denying that, that missions is important because people need to know God and because their life will be made more abundant. I mean, that's true and that's awesome and people need to... People need that abundant life, but ultimately, it's about worship, and it always has been. It always will be. In a moment, J.D.'s going to come up here, and he's going to lead us in the song one more time. And during that song... I want you to think about how you're going to take this worship out these doors. How you're going to live out being salt and light and making your worship not 9.30 to 11, but 24-7, 365. Let this song envelop over you and just encourage you and drive you to worship because ultimately it's all about worship. It always has been and it always will be. Let's worship. I invite you to stand with us as we finish service this morning. Worship our God. Then came the morning that sealed the promise your buried body began to breathe out of the silence the roaring lion declare the grave has no claim on me jesus yours is the victory. Come on, church, let's 
declare our adoration for our God. So hallelujah, praise the one who set me free. Now to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, to God who alone is wise, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Let's continue our worship throughout the week. Amen. See you guys next week.